Bernd Schoner is a successful entrepreneur with more than 10 years experience who recruited the team, bootstrapped the company, attracted venture capital, and built the product and workforce that led to a successful exit. He is the author of The Tech Entrepreneur's Survival Guide, How to Bootstrap Your Startup, Lead Through Tough Times, and Cash In for Success and speaks about long-term success and why it is important to recognize the smaller successes along the way. This video is the first of three from ENET's September 2nd, 2014 meeting that was moderated by Boston business and tax attorney Robert Adelson, who was named among the top 20 Boston startup lawyers by chubbybrain.com, a website that provides tools for entrepreneurs. Uh, the first speaker tonight is going to be from the high-tech field. Uh, I, he, uh, uh, his name is uh, Bern uh, Schoner, and Bern uh, uh, started a, uh, a high-tech uh, startup out of uh, MIT in Cambridge. Uh, he had success over a long period of time, it was over more than 10 years. Uh, there was bootstrapping, there was venture capital, and eventually a successful exit. He's going to talk to us about how he was able to hold that startup together and succeed over the long term. He's also an author. He's written a book about entrepreneurship that he may mention tonight as well. So uh, let's welcome Bern Schoner. Good evening. Thanks a lot for coming and for listening. Uh, I, I want to put uh, the notion of entrepreneurial success a little bit in perspective maybe even redefine it. Um, there's absolutely no question that uh, entrepreneurs are driven by you know, financial motivations um, to some extent. In fact, yeah, the whole startup establishment is built around the notion that there's a potential for a, a, you know, a big financial windfall, there's a potential for a life-changing uh, financial event uh, for the individuals. Um, however, from the point of view of the entrepreneur who's starting a, a company, um, you know, that fin financial con con um, consideration should really take a, a back seat. In fact, you know, the advice I give to young entrepreneurs is don't do it for the money. Right? If the money is why you're becoming an entrepreneur, you're very likely to get disappointed or you know, have a major midlife crisis uh, when you don't end up the billionaire after a few years. Um, as you anticipated. So, you know, on average, entrepreneurs do, do very well, but in the individual case, there's almost no telling you know, how long it would take, how many startups you have to start before you um, really hit a big success, um, and there's just no way to, to, to predict the outcome of a particular venture. Investors are protected that way because you know, they invest in 10 companies and one of them makes it, right? or one of them is, is very large, very successful. Um, the entrepreneur has to put all his eggs into one basket and hope for that to be successful. So while it's, it's rare that you, you really um, hit the big um, exit, um, along the way there's many opportunities um, for success. And for, for most companies being founded around here, um, there's a lot of success that happens. The entrepreneur just has to recognize those moments and celebrate them because at the end of the day, that may be the only thing that's, that you re actually remember you know, from, from those entrepreneurship days. And when the big um, exit doesn't happen, you want to look back and you want to say, but this is, this is a great thing we, we, uh, gener we created. This was a great moment. Um, and, and overall, it was a, you know, a fabulous experience. So in the following, I, I tell you the story of my company, and I'm going to explicitly point out all those moments when, when we um, could have or should have celebrated success, but oftentimes we didn't even recognize it, but we were um, concerned and, and um, anxious about you know, the, the issue of the day, oftentimes you know, um, an issue of money. Um, and, and we failed to recognize that we had just done, done something really great. We got started in 
the fall of 2000, um, five PhD candidates uh, out of the MIT Media Lab. We had all worked together in the same lab for about you know, five years and, and all reached the end of our um, student um, life. Um, if there ever there was a terminal degree, it's a PhD, right? After you get your PhD, you either stay in academia and become um, work in a lab or in, at a university, or you move out um, out of that and, and um, you do a real job, right? Um, we decided we wanted to found a company, and you know, the group of people we were, we actually very quickly, you know, you know two meetings decided this is what we wanted to do, um, and. Um, and you know, we didn't think much about who was going to do what, whether this was a balanced team, which we probably should have you know, thought about. We just you know, sort of went with the flow, and there were five guys, and it made sense, so we, we found the company. That was actually the first you know, big success that we had. Right? And it's, actually, it's very difficult to get to that point. Right? It's not every day that you find a group of people who are willing to um, essentially put their careers on the line, uh, pursue this goal, um, don't you know, think too hard whether it's the right thing, just if they feel it's the right thing to do. Um, so having a good team um, to start with, if, if you have that, consider yourself lucky uh, and recognize us that the first big startup success from which a lot of other success, successes can happen. When we got started, we, we sort of wanted to have the cake and eat it. We, we wanted to do interesting technologies, we wanted to do things that we liked, um, and we also wanted to do a, a company so that we would essentially you know, have the benefit of potential um, financial upside. Um, so what, what we ended up doing is basically um, starting a service company where we would sell our um, skills and, um, and then take money in, in return, but we, and we tried to select projects that we actually liked um, and that, that we found interesting. At the time, money was difficult to come by. Right? It was the, the dot-com um, boom was just starting to um, go away. Um, so venture capital was not readily available. Um, we also realized that we had um, so many skills among the team that we could actually easily generate um, as much revenue as our peers um, would get from an angel investor. So those, those $200,000 that you take in on day one that costs you dearly, you know, that basically you have to give away a third or even half of the company for that, we would just um, generate that, that kind of revenue by working with clients and um, developing technology for them. And then it turns out we maintained that model for almost five years. And we bootstrapped the company by selling services for five years. Um, at the same time, we were building our IP. So that was the second big success. Right? If you can fund your company for, for a while at least uh, without taking in um, third-party capital, that can pay off um, heavily um, when you actually go out for capital. So in our case, when we finally went and raised venture capital, you know, we had assets, we had IP, we had revenue, um, we had a team. Um, and the money then uh, was you know, a lot more readily available and a lot cheaper for us to get. Um, so sex, success number two, yeah, bootstrapping is actually a good thing. And the longer you can do it, um, the more you can um, reap the benefits from that later. Uh, in the early 2000s, the you know, IFID technology was having um, a boom, uh, mostly driven by the needs of the retail supply chain. So we found, we found that need, we did a bunch of projects um, in RFID technology, radio frequency identification, uh, mostly on the reader side, um, and, and started to basically work in that industry. Then in 2004, the unheard of happened. Um, Walmart and other major retailers um, mandated the use of that technology at a time when, frankly, it wasn't even really working very well. So this notion that the largest company in the world would, would mandate a particular technology that wasn't ready for prime time, that was completely unheard of in the high-tech industry. For us, it was a blessing. Right? We were already there. We had a name. We, um, we were rec recognized as the leaders in that technology. Um, on the downside, 
you know, that, that hype that was created in the industry attracted a lot of, lot of other players, startups, established companies alike. They all came in, they came in with a lot of capital, and capital was readily available at that point. Um, and they basically tried to um, um, uh, benefit from that very same industry. Um, so that was the point when we decided it's time to um, take in capital and stay competitive, stay ahead of the curve. We raised $20 million, um, didn't have to give away much of the company at that point, um, and, and transformed the company from a services company into a product company that would design and manufacture um, devices. Unfortunately, only about two or three years later, it became apparent that that dream of the, the RFID-enabled supply chain, where everybody knew where everything was, um, in terms of goods flowing from the Procter & Gamble's to the warehouse, um, to the Walmarts, that dream wasn't happening. When we developed, after we developed the technology, all of a sudden those retailers were in no rush to spend any money on the technology. <laughs> so, Obviously a difficult situation, not just for us, but for the entire industry that was really based on that promise and that had developed product, products very much targeted um, toward to that market. Um, but uh, you know, to our credit and to the credit of the industry, we actually had made good use of our time and our, on the, the much of the capital that flew into the industry at the time. We really improved the technology. We came together as an industry, developed a standard that overcame a lot of the shortcomings of the earlier generations of the technology, truly interoperable, so um, you could bring any reader and any tag uh, into the same room and they would be um, communicating with each other. Right? That was completely new at the time, um, and that was accomplished um, because everybody thought they could sell that stuff. <laughs> um, so, so when it came to basically um, redefine um, strategies and, and find new markets for this technology. And all of a sudden, we, we got very creative and we found lots of places where we could use it um, and, and basically have the technology live. Um, so that was the, the next big success. Um, the industry was really created, even so that even so the initial promise um, totally uh, fell apart. Um, nevertheless, you know, financially it was hard. Um, we uh, decided that we would change our product and portfolio and focus more on OEM products, selling to other um, businesses. So we would um, design little RFID readers that we would embed with other people's products. So RFID became a feature, um, not just a value in itself. So that before we had network appliances that could read RFID tags, we now had tiny little modules that would, could recognize a tag, uh, for example, in an RFID printer or a tag uh, recognized by a handheld um, device. And we managed to um, establish ourselves once again as a leader for that new segment um, in, the, um, in the RFID marketplace. And we are still, to this day, recognized for, for uh, creating that, those products and leading um, that development which was you know, essentially the next big success. We not only survived as a new strategy, um, but we, we created a whole new segment within the RFID industry. Um, in 2009, in the midst of the um, recession, we felt that after more than eight years, almost nine years of operations, maybe it was time to sell the company. Okay, yeah, not that one. Um, and, and it took another 18 years 18 months to um, actually sell it. We had a number of bidders. Um, one of them just wanted the, wanted the patents, so he would have, they would have dismantled the company and um, basically sent all of us home. Um, the second uh, bidder wanted the, um, the technology and a few key engineers, so most of us still would have you know, lost our jobs, um, so we were able to pass on that one too. And then the, the finally, the winning bidder was um, Terminal Navigation, um, which bought us in the fall of 2010. Um, they maintained the company in its integrity. They're still running us as an independent division within the um, larger um, entity. And maybe the biggest success for us was that we were able to um, sell the company, find a permanent home for all the employees, um, 
and basically gave him an opportunity to you know, stay in their jobs, um, do interesting work uh, for years to come. In fact, I expect the same magic legacy um, to stay on uh, for, for decades because those products are really there to last and to um, serve the customer for a long time to come. And yeah, since um, Rob brought it up, um, you can you know, find my book on my website. It's www.danshona.com. Um, so you can go from there and, and purchase it. Yeah, it's my, my full name.com. Dan Shona. It's also on our website. This video was a presentation of IEEE Boston Entrepreneurs Network, ENET. Founded in 1991, ENET offers 18 programs per year for the benefit of entrepreneurs. During a program year from September to June, ENET holds 10 monthly program meetings on the first Tuesday in Waltham, Massachusetts, and seven mid-month program meetings in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and ends each year with the July Sunset Networking Cruise of Boston Harbor. Each ENET program meeting typically features three expert speakers on a topic of interest to technology-based entrepreneurs from a wide array of high-tech, internet, mobile, and life science fields. To learn more and view our current year's schedule of meetings, go to www boston-enet.org. You can also view archives of past meetings of ENET since 2005 at http colon slash slash www.boston-enet.org slash meeting slash meeting dash archives. Yeah. Mm -hmm.